Hello? That's fine. So, hello, my name's Mark Filipiak. Um, I'm going to talk about using OpenFoam on Archer this afternoon. Um, let me just get the... Uh, no, wait, uh, I don't want to do that. Want to minimize that, and there we go. So, um, uh, just to point out, this this talks about how to how to use OpenFoam, um, assuming that you already know how to the details of using op of sorry for using OpenFoam on Archer. It's not for um, how to use OpenFoam generally. So it's not a tutorial uh, session on OpenFoam. It's how to uh, set up your jobs, compile. Um, uh, Compile OpenFoam and some tips about how to um, how to match OpenFoam to the the Luster file system that we have on Archer. So what do we have installed on Archer? We have at the moment we have four versions. Um, uh, they're all installed on the compute nodes, and at the moment 2.2.2 uh, .2 .2 is installed on the serial nodes. Um, and the latest version, which is 2.4, uh, should be installed on serial nodes in the next few weeks, I would say. Um, um, Adrian Jackson has, has installed the, the older versions and I've installed the, the, the latest version. And Adrian just points out that um, version 2.3.1 has got a slightly different uh, setup. I'll, I'll come to that in the next slide. Um, so in general, I would recommend you use the latest version. Um, all the bug fixes that, that OpenFoam um, have, have, um, have found uh, will, have been, will have been added. Um, and I suppose the, the reasons to keep with an older version is um, if you're doing a long series of runs and you want a stable um, version rather than um, necessarily uh, an up-to-date version or you've validated a particular version against uh, some experimental data and you're now doing a load of numerical experiments, or it could be that you've developed code for a particular version and um, you'll want to stick with that version. But in that case, the recommendation is, is to update your um, code to work with the latest version. Um, and I noticed that on the OpenFoam wiki that uh, there are a couple of um, um, applications that have already been updated to 2.4. So how do you actually, how do you use OpenFoam on Archer? Um, just, oops, sorry. First of all, the, the difference between the compute nodes and the serial nodes, why are the two versions of, of, of OpenFoam? So the compute nodes have MPI and you um, have the AVX instructions which give you increased vectorization. Um, so you basically use them for the whole whole of OpenFoam, so your parallel solvers, any parallel utilities, um, and if you have some serial utilities as a part of the job, they can be run on the compute nodes as well. Um, the serial nodes, they're not for parallel processing, um, and they don't have the AVX instructions, but they do have a lot of memory. So you should use those if you have to do some uh, pre or post processing. Uh, things like reconstruct part. Uh, require a large amount of memory if you have a very large case. Um, so you could run that on the um, serial nodes, so the, the post-processing nodes. So how do you use OpenFoam? Um, for the earlier versions, uh, you have to use the um, use the GNU programming environment. All the, all the versions of OpenFoam have been built with GNU. Um, it's best to uh, unset the uh, location of the foam installation directory and the site directory just to make sure that they're not carried through. And then just as you normally would do with any open foam installation, you source the bash RC file, which is in the open foam dash version number, et cetera, directory. Now the difference for um, version 2.3.1 is that uh, this part here, just a second. Uh, so for 2.3.1, this bit is missing. So you just do 2.3.1 bash RC. But that probably will be changed uh, soon to be consistent with the rest of the um, versions. For 
before, it's slightly different. Uh, there's now a module which you load first, um, and you still go through the sequence of sourcing the uh, bash RC file as before. In fact, this module, all that does is set this variable to make it easy to find the, um, the uh, open foam installation. And it has a whole load of help information when you do module help open foam. Uh, in general, the, the installed open foam would be enough for most uses. Uh, but if you want to compile it, um, for the older versions, uh, you should have a look at the, the Archer open foam web page. I've, I've put the um, URL at the end of the, the talk. Uh, for the latest version, it's uh, slightly different. You load a module and follow the instructions that you get from doing module help. It, it, the attempt here was to try and um, there are a lot of changes you have to make within OpenFoam to uh, set compilers um, for Archer. So that's all being put into a tar file, which you tar on top of your installation, and then uh, follow the instructions to compile. But maybe you don't need to compile OpenFoam. Compiling OpenFoam takes nine hours on the serial nodes. Um, and if you the third party uh, libraries which which come with OpenFoam take about 15 minutes, but OpenFoam itself takes nine hours. So I would recommend that if you're just modifying an application or a library, then um, follow what is follow the method described in section 3.2 of the OpenFoam user guide. You have to uh, set up OpenFoam as normal. Oop, that's not very good. Um, and then copy the application or library source directory to your OpenFoam directory, uh, make mo your modifications, and, and compile it. And the way OpenFoam is set up, because it's dynamically linked, it will pick up those applications and those uh, libraries before the standard OpenFoam ones. So that's just sort of the mechanics of how to use, how to set up and use OpenFoam. What uh, are the differences that um, you have to be aware of on, on Archer. So the first is um, all the files have to be on slash work to be accessible from the compute nodes. And, and I assume you all know that already. So your case directories and files, um, they all have to be on slash work. So your, your foam run directory will be somewhere on work. In addition, your user applications and user libraries have to be on slash work. Open foam is dynamically linked. so those have to be somewhere that the um, somewhere accessible to the compute nodes when you start up OpenFoam. So um, to make this a bit easier, uh, when you when you set up a version of OpenFoam using the bash rc file, it will set the user directory to work. So this is an example. This is my um, OpenFoam directory uh, for version 2.4. Usually this would be it, it, the, the standard location would be in your home directory. It would be, so you'd have um, this part here would be your home directory, and uh, you'd have this underneath your home directory. But that won't work on Archer. So this is why this is set up this way. Um, now, the important thing, of course, is that slash work is not backed up. Uh, and so you will need to, to make sure that you don't lose your um, programs and your data. So for your source files, for your applications and libraries that you've made modifications to, uh, the recommendation is to use some version control system, subversion or git. And a, it should say backed up repository here. Um, that could be somewhere on slash home, um, or it may be somewhere um, on your, on your um, local uh, computing uh, facilities at your institution. So that's for the, the sources. If you're working on a case, um, then I would recommend that you at least mirror your dictionaries and constant data to the RDF using rsync. And um, you can have a look at the data management guide, uh, the Archer data management guide, which gives some, some information on using rsync to and from the RDF. And uh, Dominic Sloan-Murphy gave a, uh, a webinar two weeks ago on 
uh, exactly these um, aspects of, of managing your data. You may want to mirror the case results as well, uh, but usually there are a large number of files for each case as you as you um, evolve the, the the simulation through time. You'll have lots of of um, output at various times, um, and that well that will be slow for the R sync, and it will be and it does it it can affect the uh, the backup for the RDF. It will slow that down as well. Um, but if if it's just when you're working, then RSync has the advantage that the whole um, you're not copying the whole directory each time. It just synchronizes the changes, and you can use RSync for data transfer to your to your um, uh, desktop computer as well, or your or your home institution, uh, and that's described also in the, in the webinar from two weeks ago and the data management guide. And then, when you finished with a case. Um, and you want to archive it, so you've done your analysis, um, you've produced your um, your results. Create a tar file and then copy that to the RDF. That will be one large file, so it, it is ideal for the RDF file system. Um, it will be saved in one place, and if you leave it for a couple of days, so, so when you cop when you create the tar file, you should verify that it's that it's uh, it matches the directory, and then. A couple of days later, you can delete the directories um, on slash work and your R sync to directory on the RDF, or empty them if you're starting a new case with similar um, similar data. So, what else is different about Archer? You should all know that MPI run does not exist on Archer; it's app run. Um, so, when you're running a parallel um, a parallel application, it will be app run uh, and minus n times the number of processes and minus parallel. If you're also running serial utilities as part of a job on the compute nodes, then make sure you use app run as well. Just use app run minus n1 will run, it will just be one, effectively one task, um, and then you, you run your, your serial um, utility. Don't miss this out. If you run your serial utility on the uh, the job launcher nodes, this causes problems for the, the the batch system and problems for other users as well who are using that um, job launcher nodes. So I'm, I mentioned earlier that Arch has been built using the GNU programming environment. This is uh, it, it can be built with the Intel compiler, but using GNU is um, is the easiest. Everything will work with GNU more or less, um, and it is. It it there may be some performance differences, but you would have to um, you would have to try this out and 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 build uh, OpenFOAM with Intel, the Intel compiler, and see if there are in fact significant differences before you decide to shift. Um, the point is, you will have to build any applications or libraries um, with the GNU programming environment. Also, so you just use this. You you swap. You the default um, default programming environment is Cray, and so you would use this command to swap to GNU. Uh, in the examples I gave earlier, for the uh, for the older versions, you have to do this uh, explicitly. For the latest version, this is actually done uh, in the bash rc file, or actually in the uh, site preferences file. Um, And as I said, you can build OpenFOAM with the Intel compiler, but the Intel compiler and also the Cray compiler, at the moment, uh, you can't use them on the compute nodes. So you wouldn't be able to use the code stream um, uh, methods in your OpenFOAM um, dictionaries with the Intel compiler. Um, the other difference is you're probably used to having Paraview built with OpenFOAM. Uh, in, in for none of the versions, um, yeah, for Paraview is built is not being built with any of the versions, um, and we recommend you use the centrally installed Paraview using module load Paraview. Uh, the disadvantages are you won't have the the 
open from specific file readers and user interface. Um, but PowerView has its own built-in versions. Uh, so you would lose things like uh, being able to label patches. Uh, um, but I think you gain, uh, I'm pretty sure that the um, open from uh, provided version can't deal with decomposed cases directly, whereas Paraview's version can, which means you don't have to reconstruct your case. So that's um, sort of the technicalities. What about performance? Well, I can't really talk about the performance of particular uh, simulations. That depends on on the simulation and, and, and how it actually scales the sizes and things like that. But um, one possible problem with um, using OpenFoam and Archer is that OpenFoam produces a lot of files and the slash work file system is a lost of file system and that's not optimized for large numbers of files. So the f I actually have a question now for the, for the participants. I, have, I want to get an idea of how large a um, simulation you run. So does anyone run uh, simulations with 10,000 processes? Anyone run with simulations with, so you can, so you can either, I um, uh, can't see it on my screen, you can either put up your hand to talk if you want to speak or you can just type in the chat window uh, on the left-hand side of the uh, collaborate window, if you want to say. So does anyone use, do simulations with a thousand processes? A uh, hundred? Yeah, well, okay. So maybe this isn't, maybe this isn't actually a problem, but um, do, does anyone have problems with, um, with with their file access with with OpenFoam. No, okay. Well, we maybe can s skip the next few slides, but I'll I'll continue just in case you're going to run with large numbers of processes. Um, to to be honest, I, I've tried this on our on our um, on our uh, test system with a thousand processes, and and it's just with the, the cavity case, um, and but beefed up to, to have larger files, and I found very little effect of uh, the right times compared with the, the solved times. Um, so anyway, so with OpenFoam, each process writes a, a file for each output field at each output time. So if you have, say, um, four output fields, so you've got velocity, pressure, phi, and maybe temperature, or, or a scalar. Um, and you're writing out for uh, you're writing out 50 output time steps, and you're running on 10 nodes, so that's 24 process, 240 processes. So that means in total you've got almost 100,000 files sitting in your um, in your case directory tree. Um, now, luckily, the the the, the process, processes directory is right at the very top. Um, so uh, once that's set up, the, uh, some of the, the metadata information is, is, um, is um, not having to be um, set for, for a directory with large numbers of files. But even so, that this, this means that um, at each time step, you're opening, uh, opening and closing large numbers of files. So a luster, um, Actually, opening and closing files can be slow. It all goes through the metadata server, this MDS, uh, which is a single, uh, a single computer. It's, it's, it's fast. There's lots of cores in it. Uh, but even so, it, it, this, this can slow things down. And also, generally, if you have large numbers of processes, so as to be larger than the number of um, OSTs, so effectively the number of, um, I wouldn't call them RAID arrays, but basically, independent uh, sets of disks. If they're much larger than the number of, of, of these sets, then you'll, have, then you'll have several processes all trying to read and write from one set of disks, so you can get contention for access. So um, there are some ways to match, to try and um, reduce the impact of this, these differences. Um, the 
first and easiest thing is just to set the striping to one. Uh, in, if you set that in your your um, your foam run directory, then that will be inherited by all files and directories underneath that. Um, but only if you move files in, uh, they won't change their stripe count. So by doing that, you 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 um, should reduce the uh, contention a bit uh, when processors are writing to to uh, files. The default stripe is four, so it would be striped over uh, four OSTs. So this, yeah. So the question here is, if your uh, I/O takes a significant fraction of your job time, then you might want to change some settings in your control dictionary. Though, uh, so if you're finding these, you're having problems, then you could try these um, changes. But this will, of course, change what you get out from OpenFOAM. So you could increase the write interval and write um, at uh, fewer numbers of time steps. But then, if you're wanting to, ha if you actually need that uh, number of uh, output time steps, say you're say you're doing a movie, um, then that may not be possible. Another suggestion is to use binary format for the fields. Uh, so you just with write format binary instead of write format ASCII, which is the, the default. Uh, again, with tests, I didn't find a strong difference between these two, um, but uh, perhaps for larger um, files, this can make a difference. Um, the other suggestion, if you're, if you're uh, actually using OpenFOAM to um, Solve to a, a steady state solution. You can use purge write one, which means that you don't uh, you don't write out every um, every few time steps to a different uh, different set of files. You will just overwrite the same set of files each time. So you will get your solution. You will get your solution at the end of your um, simulation, but uh, you won't have a, a large number of files at the end. Um, one other suggestion, which is which I've seen. Uh, made is to switch off uh, runtime modifiable. It, every if you have that switched on runtime modifiable, yes, then the dictionaries are read every time step because you can modify these to actually modify your simulation. Uh, I don't think this should have any effect really because with the setup we have on Archer and. I think this would be the default for any MPI setup for OpenFOAM. It is only 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 one process reads these dictionaries, um, and that's an acceptable um, overhead. It's just one process reading one file, one small file every time step. Um, there is uh, an HDF5 library for OpenFOAM, which might help, especially with the um, the cost for opening and closing all these files. Uh, but I think that's only up to version 2.3, uh, and there are some limitations. So I don't think boundaries are boundary conditions are written out. It can't deal with polyhedra, and um, if you're doing a restart, so you have you've, you've run your OpenFOAM job for uh, 24 hours on on Archer and you're then wanting to restart from your last time step, then I don't think that the library at the moment has a way to read. You, you can write out uh, the data in HDF5 format, but I don't think you can read it. So you would have to do the restarts in the standard open phone way. Um, as I said, the, the open phone is dynamically linked, um, and, it, and you can dynamically load libraries. So you, if you're using the uh, the libs dictionary to to load um, shared objects that you've uh, created, and you can use and function object libs, which will load uh, either objects you've created or the standard um, function objects from OpenFOAM. Um, and it also has runtime compilation, and that works by creating a shared object, and then all of the processes uh, dynamically load that. So for all of these cases, each process opens a shared object and reads them um, as they're needed, so when you call a function. Um, and some of those will be on slash work, because that's where OpenFOAM is. Um, so there can be many accesses to many small files, and that may be slow. Um, 
I haven't tested this at, at large scale, so it's, again, if no one has, has had problems, you'd, you'd see this mainly, I think, when you start up. So if you compared um, when you started OpenFoam to, uh, if you had a look at the log, the, the, the first time in the log, then you can give an indication that this is a problem. Um, if you're finding this is a problem, then uh, there's a package called DLFM, which uh, we've used successfully for um, Python, like, uh, Python programs on Archer, um, and with, it will require some modification to, um, it may require some modification to open from, uh, but it should be able to um, deal with this problem as well. But please contact the Archer help desk if you want to do that. That's not so straightforward. Um, so that's working with the file system. Um, I said earlier that uh, Paraview is um, not compiled with, with OpenFoam and, um, and to use the, the system, uh, the system installed version of Paraview. So there, even with that, there are several choices um, and you, depending on what you want to do, um, my recommendation is actually is that you transfer the results to your desktop and run Paraview there. Assuming you have a fast graphics card, you will get fast rendering and your user interface will be fast just because you're, you're um, using it locally. Um, so that would be my recommendation if you have a good graphics card. If you just have your laptop with um, the integrated graphics, I found that that is not, uh, is not ideal at all. Um, the alternative is, uh, an alternative way which can be fast rendering and a fast user interface is you can run the PV server, so that's Paraview server program in parallel on the compute nodes and you have the Paraview client on your desktop. So you tunnel, you, you have to tunnel through from the compute nodes through the logger nodes to your desktop. Um, but Aiden tells me that uh, the rendering is fast and of course the interface is fast because you're on your on your client. Uh, but just note that that will use up your allocation because you're actually using the compute nodes. Uh, the next, sorry, the next least desirable um, is running PV server on a post-processing node with Paraview client on your desktop. So you again tunnel through using SSH. Um, and I find for that the rendering is slow and the user interface is fast. And the worst case would be to run Paraview on a post-processing node and you'd just be using your X11 connection and then everything is slow, rendering and the user interface. Um, there is a possible fifth option which is to run, you could run the PV server in parallel on the compute nodes and a Paraview client on the, um, on a login node. So that would give you fast rendering, but it would give you slow user interface. If you, if you want to try out um, uh, some of these uh, methods, have a look at the Paraview webpage on the uh, Arch website and um, if you can contact the, the help desk and Adrian will give you a hand with uh, setting up the, the tunneling if required and certainly also with um, this, uh, which is which is quite complicated to, to set up the this session. So that um, is the end of the webinar. Here's some links and references. Um, there is a there's a web page uh, for Open Foam on Archer. So um, it covers some of the, the stuff I've, I've talked about in the webinar. At the moment, it does not have the information about Open Foam 2.4. And of course, there is the OpenFoam user guide, uh, which is very useful. Um, and we have our, if you want to read about how to use rsync and tar and the best ways to, to manage your, your data, have a look at the data management guide. And then there are these two, um, these two guides on, on more specialized um, uh, packages, which you can use for um, if you if you're gonna if you finally you have problems with the 
the file system uh, access with OpenFOAM. So that's the uh, end of the webinar. If you have any questions, then uh, please either um, hold up your hand to talk or type into the chat window. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be any questions. Um, that either means that it was all very uh, informative or well, not exactly what you wanted. So um, I'll wait for a few minutes and we'll close the webinar. Okay, so thanks everyone for attending this um, this webinar. Will be available on the Archer website, uh, the recording, and the chat and the slides. Um, goodbye.